Okay, we're gonna just record to the cloud. You probably got a note saying, is it okay to record? Say okay. If you're not comfortable, please sign off and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. But it looks like everybody's <clears throat> comfortable. So with that, it is my great pleasure. I'm gonna go from my view to gallery to speaker view. The reason I'm in speaker view is that whenever anyone talks, so for example, you probably only see Mitch Ryan because he must be saying something. So I'm gonna mute Mitch for a moment. I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna ask to, I'm gonna ask anyone who's not muted to mute themselves. So I have everyone muted at the moment, I believe. What I don't understand is why am I full screen with, uh, with Mitch? If I have everybody muted, this makes no sense. Okay, well, we'll let it go as it is. So with that, let me make sure, Mitch, I, unfortunately I can't hear you. I'm gonna unmute you, ask to unmute. Let's see if Mitch can get unmuted. I did. Thank you. So Donald, uh, it is my great pleasure by a, a freak of nature, by being in the farmer's market at the Marconda's meat counter, I ran into twice Patty Freed four years apart. Mm. When I met her the second time, she said, you come to my house on Saturday. I didn't know what I was getting into, but it changed my life. And the man who did it is with us today, and he is our host, and that is the esteemed Donald Freed. And Donald, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, you're muted. Let me see if we can get you unmuted. It is my great pleasure to introduce Donald Freed. Unmuted. You got it. I, I'm going to make a technology guy out of you. Take it away, Donald. All right. Now I'm seeing you and I'm seeing a, a little notice saying this meeting is being recorded. Yes. So say, okay. I'll just say, got it. Got it. And you should be fine. And you're only going to see who speaks. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm seeing you now. That's correct. Well, hello, everybody. I'm more or less seeing all of you, and I'm glad you're here. And uh, I think we all owe a, a real debt to Dr. Carnell. Gary uh, uh, took the ball. He, um, he saw what this book was. He knew its origin. He can preview, in a way, its future. <clears throat> and he began a series of uh, uh, meetings, starting with today, and they will grow until there's a, a sufficiently large movement of, to break through various barriers. Um, so thanks to Gary, his solidarity, his debt of honor to the International Writer Seminar and to writers uh, of all time, all ages, all places. Uh, it makes for a wonderful day. Um, he himself, about this time next year, will have a play and a book ready when theaters uh, reopen and bookstores um, flourish. Until then, uh, we will all be working to promote Mick Mitchell's book. Uh, I'll say this about the reason we're here. Uh, you know, uh, Albert Camus said that a new theater changes history. And it's true that new writers change history too. They change it in a way at the level of ideas and the level of feelings at the deepest levels of all. They're not on billboards necessarily, but they are inside the readers. Truthful writing uh, spreads, it grows, uh, it encompasses. Uh, and it uh, matches and attempts to do combat with the viruses of lies, 
and of false narratives of big lies uh, as opposed to just uh, ordinary lies and damn lies and statistics, <laughs> big lies. It's the only antidote to the big lies. It, it is, as Camus said, that uh, there was truth and there was untruth. But if you clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. And this work of Mitch, Mitch Ryan's Fall of a Sparrow, it has a, a resonation starting with the character. It uh, goes back to the uh, to the New Testament, and it goes on to Shakespeare, and then on to the stream of uh, our language. And um, the detail implied in that, and focus implied in that title, is in this book. It carries four, four generations. Uh, actually, it comes, starts in Ireland and it comes to uh, the period before the Civil War and then through the Civil War with some matchless scenes. If you've done Civil War reading and been interested in it, you'll see here dramatized versions, which you can never forget. From uh, But leaving behind in Ireland, there is always the... Uh, unforgettable sketches and portraits of the older generation uh, who stay in touch with the uh, their offspring in the new world uh, through letters that in themselves are epistolary magic the way Mitch writes them. And uh, the Civil War passes and on into the later 19th century and then into the 20th century and then finally into the life and times of Mitchell Ryan himself, not to be confused with the uh, author of the book. I only say that is, it is one and the same, but it is subject to the kind of uh, a riveting anatomy of uh, success and failure of dreams, uh, hopes and prayers and uh, losses and uh, uh, but the losses are, as Faulkner says, they grieve on universal bones. They're important. They're idiosyncratic. Everybody lives in their own shell, you might say. But the common denominators of uh, love, work, suffering, loss of love, all the big headlines uh, in their invisible and, you might say, chemical and, and uh, phylogenetic uh, manifestations in the dreams, uh, in the feelings of the characters, right through to the end. And uh, along the way, the uh, trail um, winds through uh, from Ireland to the south, to the north, to um, New York, to Hollywood, to the sound stages, but most of all to the stages. And I would say that uh, uh, Mitchell Ryan is the uh, linear descendant of the great American Shakespearean actors, and he worked with the last of them, Ian Keith, and he carried away that which was movable from Mr. Keith. And he left uh, portraits of Iago, uh, of Gloucester, of Lear, of mm, leading roles in many, many of the Shakespearean plays. And in his reading of uh, Falstaff uh, and the bellowing answer to the rhetorical question from the battlefield that Falstaff puts to himself, can honor set to a leg? And the answer is no. But when Mitch bellows it, no, it is heard down the ages and it slips right past the Elizabethan court, which is the only word you'd ever need for war and for injustice, that no, as Mitch reads it. So this is a celebration. Uh, I've worked with Mitch a long time and, and really met him through Salome Jens, his great partner, as they brought O'Neill to life. The revivals of O'Neill, of Salome and Mitch, uh, beginning in New York and elsewhere, uh, really uh, with the moon for the misbegotten. Uh, that made it, history, it was at the time uh, there of Geraldine Page and the revival of Tennessee Williams, 
uh, followed by Mitch and Salome in the revival of O'Neill, the later plays, Strindberg, all the stage work, which of course is up, upstaged by film and television because the audiences are, are much larger at any given time. But there's nothing like the theater and uh, the transitory nature of the stage doesn't make the images less memorable or less um, in, in introjected. And uh, if you've heard Mitch at full power uh, on the stage and seen him, you, you'll never forget those performances. Well, it's all taken together in this big book. And it's a really big book. And I mean that in the sense of the golden age of American writing of the, uh, it ends with a reference to Scott Fitzgerald. And that reference is, uh, is, is earned, you might say. Uh, that's in the final word that Mitch has to it. It's earned. He's a part of that tradition. He has been a great reader and he is now a great writer. And it's, I'm going to join you uh, in enjoying a reading from the book. So now, Gary, uh, Mitch is coming on. Yes. I'm going to. I am. Yes, Mitchell. So, Donald, I, I've muted you so you get to laugh as much as you'd like. And, Mitchell, I'm going to mute myself. Please take it away. Where is my picture? Aren't everybody seeing me? Listen, thank you, Donald. That was a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing to, to say about me. I appreciate it very much. The whole problem of this book, which is uh, the reason for it, is um, not only the great generational uh, disintegration from one to the next generation and all the glories and uh, together with it, but um, the study of the difference between what a man is and what an actor is. And uh, it's a big problem because it, uh, somehow does not jive it. Uh, there are many, many reasons for this. And um, I'm just going to read a little snippet of the of the something here, because the whole book is such an encompassing situation, I couldn't hope to find anything real typical. But this is uh, this is after he searched all over Hawaii, uh, Honolulu, looking for his, for the reason his son is dying. And uh, at the end, he finds himself in a bar. He's quit drinking, but he's in a bar. And he, um, he um, has found out from the waitress that his boy was there and that right soon after that he was killed. He remembered when he was a lonely drunk, wandering from bar to bar, looking for some spark of life beyond the moment to moment horror of his wretched life and finding for a brief time a stranger who could be taken for a comrade. A well-dressed man, say, drunk at the bar, who would allow you to tell the tragic story of your failure in school. A doctor, you say, you wanted to be, and the sad death of your mother. There is always these funeral caves, men like yourself to listen to your lies, and tell your own the glorious fantasies of a made-up life, anything to relieve the horror of the moment. And always a girl, oh yes, a lovely sweet girl who will hold you and sympathize with you and listen to you. Most importantly, she must listen. 
She must realize that you are worth something. And someday people will see you for what you are. Then you can resist the daredevil stunts of showing off, climbing to the top of the bridge and walking across the railing with a boy and the bay far below. Or getting the shit kicked out of you for telling a loudmouth marine twice your size to shut up just to show off. Then you will duck into the toilet and in the mirror, a flush of blood in your mouth and the wretchedness of your stupid life will draw from you a vow to the end of all this tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. You leave the bar and leap on your symbol of manhood, your motorbike, and at reckless speed defy all the laws of sane driving. Mitch's thoughts evaporated, and he could do nothing but stand by the ocean, see nothing at all. The heavy cloud of mixed pity and loss worked as a veil, and all that was before him was gone. He was blind. It was sickening to begin to realize how alike they were, these two men, the father and the son, who never knew each other. Then, like a fade up in a film, the moon slowly became a long streak of silver across the water. His eyes followed the moonbeam from the edge all the way to the moon. He hesitated a moment, then stepped forward. The water was soft and hardly moving. He went in further and stood up to his knees. The sky was immense and the water under him was laced with silver. He raised his arms and floated right up to the moon. Yes, there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. That's the um, the end of uh, almost the end. There's another uh, afterward, but um, aside from all the wonderful stuff that I remembered about Lee Marvin and Jack Palance and James Earl Jones and Irene Pappas and Michael Kakianis and all the people that I worked with and helped me through my life. Uh, it's mainly about um, these men, my, my grandfather, my father, me, and my son, and what we gave to each other and how we destroyed each other. The, uh, the um, I don't know if I'm unmuted. You're fine. Uh, the the ordeal of the generations, Mitch. That was a a, a perfect uh, a selection, uh, really perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, and beautifully read. And uh, uh, and uh, the just speaking of writing, I mean, uh, <laughs> the lighting and uh, the nature uh, could uh, not uh, uh, be more wonderfully realized in that moonlit apotheosis of, of his uh, of his life because he's uh, he's he's traced uh, his son to the last moment uh, stopping just short of going underwater and then all the generations would have disappeared but uh, it's a it was a great choice I think um, thank you yeah yeah and uh, well, no, uh, I think you want uh, 
Gary, don't you, for people to join in now? Absolutely. And what we can do, because we have, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to gallery view, and I suggest everyone else do the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, we're getting a request for Hamlet Act 5, Scene 2. My guess is Donald probably knows that by heart, as well as Mitch. That would be the great diggers, I think. <laughs> So because uh, I, think, I think we'll start this way. Um, I certainly owe a debt of honor to Patricia Freed. It's Patricia Freed who created the seminar along with Donald um, many, many years ago. And we have a, a member with us, Lance Fogan. He can, he can wave his hand if he would like to. Lance was an original member of the group. Um, I just wanna point out the people that are currently um, or formerly in the group and then we'll open it up to questions. All you have to do is at the very bottom of your screen, there's reactions, you can raise your hand and I will certainly call on you. And then you can ask Mitch or Donald um, any question that you'd like. If you'd like to ask me a question, call me later. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Just looking at the top, I, I want to give a nod of, I'm just going in the order that I see. Obviously Mitchell Ryan has been there since the day I started, but has been been working with Donald for many, many years. I'm a newbie, I'm only four years. Uh, Joanna Ratkins, if you wanna wave your hand, Joanna. Um, and in fact, you can tell us how long you've been with the writing seminar if you'd like. You can unmute yourself. I think we can do that as we talk. And while she's doing that, I'm gonna point out Karen Lacey. I see Karen next. Um, Karen is a really valuable member of our group. Hey, Karen. And Annette Ballister is here. And how could I not forget? And Dorothy, I'm going to let you unmute yourself. Dorothy Sinclair, um, who is absolutely uh, one of the most incredible um, people I've ever met. Um, can we say how old you are, Dorothy? I don't know. Oh, uh, 41. On 4th, last year, on January 4th, I was 95. And that's... Uh, it's questionable whether that's an age you want to achieve or not. Well, I know that Dorothy worked with Donald and she has two wonderful books that, oh my gosh, they're just great. And anyone uh, who knows me, I'll certainly give you the links to those. They're available on Amazon. Um, Marsha was a member of the class for many, many years. Um, Alex and Stefan are, um, uh, are members of the class right now. Alex, uh, Stefan, do you want to just say where you're calling from? Here we go. Yes, we are, we are calling here from Cornwall. And I have to point out that that is Cornwall, United Kingdom, and not Cornwall <laughs> on Hudson in New York State. <laughs> so the, uh, the bad thing about COVID was death and dying. The good thing is we imid immediately pivoted to Zoom and we've been meeting, we started, we normally meet at one o'clock every Saturday afternoon, rain or shine, holiday or not, mm. uh, 47 weeks a year. Um, however, now under COVID, we started at 10 a.m., which allowed some folks in Europe to be a part of the seminar, which has just added a whole wonderful aspect to it. We have gone back live, we will of course, we're going to take some time off because many of us are going to France for an intensive writing session. And when we come back after we end up our 14 days of quarantine, we'll be back in into live again. So with that, um, Ivy Estrada, it was a member of our, our group and she can wave her hand. Um, Shirley Goodall is my one of my oldest friends from Alhambra. And I think she's now going to want to join the group because we can write about Alhambra. We have a lot to say. Uh, Paul, and, and I'm blanking on Paul's last name, and I should know it, um, but Paul, of course, is the man who does Donald's website. Paul Berkowitz. And, Paul Berkowitz, thank you so much. I mean, I'm like going crazy. Lance Fogan's neighbor. Um, and Paul a documentarian Berkowitz. filmmaker of his own. Absolutely, and did Patty's film that we all saw on January 14th, 2018 at the IPIX Theater in Westwood. <clears throat> And next are Michael and Michael. They were uh, Michael C. Raise your, raise your hand. You were a member of the group. And I heard a rumor, you can turn your mic on. I heard a rumor that you're coming back. Yes, I'm coming back during COVID and 
turning 60, I realized I'd likely still make a living with what I do instead of writing. So I had to take some time. Away. <laughs> but uh, just in seeing, you know, Donald and Patty recently and, and getting the bug again, I'll be joining again once they're back from France. And, and you know, Michael, that's exactly how all of us feel. Uh, life gets in the way of our writing. Michael and, uh, Pastillo designed the cover to this book, the book jacket, which is absolutely glorious, I think. Bravo. And, was, and thank you, Mitch. That was my next comment was and anybody else would like to hire him. He's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Michael, I, I want you. Be, but he's worth every penny. So, Michael, I want you to be thinking of design for the red streetcar. Just keep that in mind. Uh, then we have Lance. Uh, then we have Jackie Bell from Canada. Jackie, you can unmute yourself, too, if you want. Um, and Jackie, you want to say a word or two to, to Mitch and the group because you're such a valuable fam part of our family. <laughs> Thank you. I just miss you all so much. Mitch, that was brilliant. And I miss those very few times that I got to be in class in Los Angeles. And I miss Donald and Patty and all of you and France. Yeah. That's all. Yes. <laughs> and, and next is Kalista. And Kalista has just joined our group. You want to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about why you joined the group? Because your story is so wonderful. Hi. Um, well, I owe it all to Patty and Donald, who for years encouraged me to join. And I was uh, uh, pretty shy about it. But um, and it turns out that um, after tons and tons of years of thinking about writing, um, with their encouragement and with my own David's encouragement, um, I've actually started. So that's, that's pretty. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, and I get to hear that every week and I so love it. I'm going to go on to Lynn Rothman who was a member of the group for many, many years. And boy, we miss you, Lynn. Would you please turn on your mic and say a few words to Mitch and Donald, please? Oh, uh, Donald, I miss you terribly, but I love the desert and I spend a lot of time there. <laughs> it doesn't make up for my Saturdays though. I, I, I just brings tears to my eyes. And Mitch, I, I shed a tear when I listened to you reading. That was so beautiful, so very beautiful. And I just aspire to be able to write one day as well as you do. I mean, Donald, you are, a, a, when I read through what I've written from the beginning, like it was like 14 years ago, mm. I, I, I see how I wrote then and how, and how much you've, you, you've taught me. I mean, it's been life-changing and thank you. And thank Patty for all the wonderful lunches and times. It's been such a joy. Well, this is, this is quite a reunion. Uh, Gary, I wanna say a word about the cover. Please it, do so. Yeah, it is marvelously done. And, and you see uh, in the tableau you see of Mitch here, that's of the Harry Eighth in O'Neill's play that's he's the eponymous uh, and unforgettable character and you can see Mitch give a reading of that uh, on the website of uh, the our uh, I think it's donaldfreed.com uh, a debt of honor that's the website and you can see Mitch read that and it's harrowing and unforgettable but uh, but Michael it's a, a great cover uh, absolutely and and there, there, and Michael's captured in the in the shadows and in the torque of O'Neill's uh, pain, as interpreted through the Harry Ape. Um, that's that's the an actor, the actor, the abstract and brief chronicle of the times, and uh, that's that's Mitch. And Donald, I, I want to introduce just a few more members of our class and let them say a few words, and then we'll open it up to any questions anyone has. And you know, you're next, Antonia Brancati. 
Uh, tell everyone where you're calling from and your internet connection is good today. So I'm really excited. We can't hear you. My, why don't you, you are, you are not muted. It could be that your mic is turned down. We'll come back to Antonia. She's calling from Italy. And I'm so sorry, but you can you can write something in the chat room to everyone if you'd like. She's in Sicily, obviously being censored. <laughs> yes, right. Yes, she was. And how could we not have a Zoom without having our my most favorite? Oh, I shouldn't say my most favorite person in the seminar is Phyllis. Oh. And <laughs> right. And so Phyllis, Phyllis and Lynn were going out for lunch on the 20th with the other two. You got it, right? Right. Okay, good. Perfect. Phyllis, tell us a little about your experience in the seminar and your experience with us and Mitch. Well, I was in that class, what, at least 14 years and under Donald's superb instruction, wrote, finished and published a book and finished a second book, which is about to be published. And thank him for all of his help and his wonderful leadership and a pleasure always to have been with him and with Patty. I think we should let Mitch read a little more. He has had such a very good book. I think so. I think so too. But let's get everyone um, introduced very quickly. I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone who's in the class. Susanna, I see. I see Celia and I see Susu. Susanna, if you'd like to say a few words, because you're calling from the south of France, I believe. Yes, um, I'm living in France and um, I've been in um, Donald's group for quite a long time. And I consider the fact that I do work now as a writer completely because of him and his influence on me. And having Patty and Donald in my life has been one of the most meaningful things that I can express. And I have been also extraordinarily moved by all of um, the writing of Mitch. It's unmissable to hear him speak um, and to read his words in every uh, Saturday class. And I don't know if Sila or Susu want to say anything. I, I see that they're muted, uh, but they're certainly here. And if they unmute, we'll be happy to talk with them. And with that, while I'm waiting for that, um, if you go down and you see where it says reactions, if you would just, for example, I'm gonna raise my hand, you'll see a little hand goes up, then I'll know to call on you and you can ask a question um, of Donald or of Mitch or of some of these. There's, uh, Antonia has said to everyone, hi everybody, I go back to Rome next week and hopefully my internet will work better. And I look forward to the France seminar, great work, Mitch. That's from An Antonia. A Antonia treats us to champagne every night in France. So we, we really, I'm the looking forward to that. Um, great, I'm looking for a hand or Joanna, maybe you have a question or? Um, I think every no everyone is so starstruck when when Mitch commands the room. Um, uh, Dorothy, I can't believe that you don't have a question. You have to unmute yourself. Maybe Stefan. Stefan is actually a, a theater director. He may and has directed many of Donald's plays. So maybe Stefan, you have a question you'd like to ask. I, I, I do. Um, I remember, I think the very first conversation I ever had with Mitch was at Patty and Donald's. And he said to me, do you like Shakespeare? <laughs> uh, with, you know, with a very suspicious look about him. And I remember the thrill when I said yes. And then I did, you know, I've never been the same since I directed Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have to say, ha having heard you, Mitch, read various parts of Shakespeare, um, I can honestly say I've never heard anybody else read it like it before. And that is a massive compliment because you pick out from it something that no one else I've ever heard can pick out from it. Uh, and I, I, I have actually learned so much from you for that. So when I direct Shakespeare again, it will be <laughs> Mitchell Ryan. 
Steph, those are uh, um, sterling words. Uh, it's true, you know, uh, the only, he, Mitch chooses uh, words, I, I referenced no before, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the power of, uh, that Michael Redgrave did. And, uh, and, and Steph, uh, Mitch, uh, uh, Tony Richardson directed Mitch in uh, a big production of Julius Caesar. At the, at the theater center. And he did years uh, of the Shakespeare in the Park, that historic stuff at which you saw in New York too. But I don't need to speak for Mitch, but maybe some of them would like to hear him read a little more. Yes. Yeah, that, that would be super. Yes, Mitch. Stefan. You get to choose whatever you'd like. Stefan, um, uh, I'm only available for the second grave digger in Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only part I'll play in England. I'm going to have to think again. <laughs> and so, so we'll actually, we can talk the next time I'm over. <laughs> actually, actually, I do have a question since we have uh, Mitch here on the line. Uh, Mitch, you in your uh, reading in class, you talked about your first time you ever were on a movie, and it was with Robert Mitchum, I believe. Could yeah. you tell a little bit about that story? Well, yeah, yeah sure. Um, I was uh, uh, 22 years old and I had been cast out of a summer stock company in um, Virginia to do a movie, Thunder Road, which is an occult movie now or something. Yeah. And anyway, they, uh, uh, in Asheville, which is right around the road. You know, and so I got there and I was, um, standing around the set and nobody was talking to me or nothing. And there were a whole lot of thousands of people there, like in a movie. And I wondered what all these people did. They were, were just standing there. <laughs> and finally, Mitchum came out of his uh, dressing uh, honey wagon and uh, uh, went over and talked to the um, the AD and, and the AD pointed over to me and uh, so Mitchum looked over at me and in a minute or two, he started walking toward me and he walked all the way across the yard there, the road and came right up to my face. And uh, he looked like he was uh, like 14 feet tall or so, but, and then Robert Mitchum is very imposing no matter what. And he looked down at me and said, uh, I want to tell you one thing, kid. I'm Big Mitch, and you're Little Mitch. <laughs> and uh, then he said, "You, uh, you're from the theater, right? Well, do you want to rehearse, or can we shoot this fucking thing?" <laughs> well, Mitch, Mitch, since this is going on the internet, um, you are allowed to swear. But we all know that when we, you know, when we write for Donald, we are not to use no, the, the F word. He, he's not swearing, he's quoting. Oh, you're right, you're right, yeah. you're right. Um, I and know Mitch I can. Mitch I, can do anything he wants to. <laughs> well, I've learned from Richard Benjamin that we can't use it, and I hear the is about the next word to go, but you <laughs> you are right, Donald. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to the play and I'm gonna put the F word in oh, as I, long I, as the dialogue. I told Donald this, but uh, the, uh, uh, I think I told him, but he has, he has many times over the last year said, you know, you don't need, he said, she said, he said, they said, you know, uh, hardly at all, You every now and then, but yeah. You know. So I took them all out and the editor at the publishing house put them all <laughs> back in. <laughs> so I had to spend hours getting them all out again. Now you know how Jimmy Durante feels. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, uh, folks, uh, I know Marsha has a question in just one second. I see her hand up. I yeah. do want to say that we, uh, Sung Hae, who is in our class, not with us today, she's done a great job. Yesterday, we, we have a, um, a YouTube site up. It, this will be the first of many on the YouTube. As soon as we get 100 views, then we get to put our own banner on. So um, look for it probably in the next day or two. We've also created a, um, 
uh, two different Twitter accounts. And so those of you who are here, I'll send all of that out over email. And to get the ball rolling, um, we wanted, of course, to start with Donald because none of us would be here without Donald. And well, we probably wouldn't be here without Patty. Um, and Patty is the one that we, Patty is the one who finds all, all of us in, at the chicken counter at Marcomba's in the farmer's market, what can I tell you? So uh, we're gonna do another one. Donald leaves for France next week. Um, I don't. And the next one uh, will be, uh, the, the moderator will be Richard Benjamin. So um, those of you who, um, if you're over 40, as most of you are, certainly know who Richard Benjamin is. And we look forward to uh, maybe even Paula may pop in and ask a question or two. So with that, I'm gonna to go to Marsha because she had her hand up and thank you so much, Marsha. Ask your question, please. Thank you. No, I actually don't have a question. I have a request for a specific reading. Mitch, would, for, for something a little lighter in the book, would you read the, the piece about the lethal weapon party? Would you do that? I could, yes. Do we have time? No. Well, Mitch, we have time. It's 11.50 a.m. We have another 10 minutes. Perfect. Uh, Mitch, yeah. leave just about two or three minutes. Uh, let's, we'll do it now. Everyone, uh, the point here is if you go away from here and you've ordered the book and you've read it and you'll know what all the excitement's about and if you don't already, and then the idea is to have some cookies and and coffee or tea and cookies with a few friends uh and if it's in this area uh you know and you have a a, a no a half a room full of people and and mitch is free well he he would come he would sign books he would give uh he would read from it it could be quite an experience, you know, and not just because there's a virus raging outside and people may be spending more time at home, but then that, but that, uh, then, then, then someone at the party, you then speak to them and they in their turn invite another a handful of friends. And so it goes and that builds politically very quickly. And then you get a, a, a high enough base of sales on the book to, to go up the ladder for publicity, for representation, uh, and so forth. It can be done. And because Gary has imagined and brought this off and, and build on this, uh, the hope and the thought is that everyone that now occupies a square here will in their own way, either in their apartment or home or wherever they are, or maybe simply Christmas gifts, or maybe a letter or uh, uh, getting things started, uh, maybe the local library, local bookstores. Uh, again, uh, Mitch will come and is uh, has spoken at some bookstores and with many, some of you, he has spoken at uh, bookstores, read at bookstores and uh, great times were held. Uh, so wherever you live, uh, whatever your situation, whatever your proximity here, uh, see what you can come up with, be ingenious. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a time of publishing when the great editors and the great, even the great houses, they still have the same name, but they're now lost leaders for mainly for German aspirin companies and so on. And they are not, uh, uh, they, they have books are being sold more than ever. But not there's no investment in new novels that are uh, important coming on. Uh, and uh, so that's lacking, though the technology, as you see from this book, is, is superb. These books are exactly uh, trade books. There's no difference in quality uh, at all. Uh, and this is going to be the next great generation of publishing, uh, just as Once Upon a Time Book of the Month and later uh, pocketbooks. And before that, uh, the serialization in the magazines of uh, Dickens uh, London and Trollope's London. Uh, each time uh, the price went down, but the audience expanded exponentially. That's coming because the technology is there, but right now you're on your own with it. So, but Mitch is not on his own because he is surrounded by a literary family here. So be ingenious, think about it, stay in touch, get people in the room. Of course, you can do a little politicking while you've got them there too. He wouldn't be against that. And that hasn't been mentioned today. He's done a lot of good union work and a lot of good political work. 
and he's a good old comrade. And uh, keep that in mind. Okay, now, Mitch Reed. No, before he does, I, I do want to, um, this was going to be my surprise at the end, so I certainly want to say this. As I'm looking around the room, um, almost three-fourths of the audience have been in our home, uh, and so uh, we will open our home. Um, we have doors that open, indoor, outdoor. It will be very safe. You can wear a mask. You can whatever. Um, I can easily fit 100 people in our backyard, and I hope that we'll find a very nice day to have an event that will be a catered affair, more than just cookies, and then we will certainly have Mitch here in person, and then what you will do is you will go to Amazon now, and you'll buy the book, and you'll bring it to our home, and Mitch will sign it for you. Cheers. So we are going to do that when we return from France and you, you are on my mail list. I got to all of you today. So all of you will be able to do that. We'll find a day. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. Um, before uh, we're gonna close in just about five minutes. And I think the perfect way to close is Marsha's suggestion to have yeah. Mitch read a little bit and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and Mitch, take it away. You've just been cast in uh, Lethal Weapon and invited to a, a party to uh, to kick off the film. He walked into the lush garden, however, a pool and a house whose beautiful French doors opened into the soft night, revealing dark, sumptuous rooms all around the first floor. In these rooms, handsome men and luscious young women clustered in small groups. The noise was subdued and the talk appeared to be very important until you came closer and heard uh, that Jaguar XJ is vastly superior to any BMW ever made. <laughs> Spilling out of one of the eager men, or I wouldn't use anyone else. His hands are absolute magic gushing from one of the young women. Uh, he didn't know anyone there. He introduced. He was introduced to Mel Gibson, the star, and had a nice chat with Danny Glover, the other star. A bit later, a nervous-looking young man came up to Mitch and told him his name and said he had written Lethal Weapon. Uh, he had uh, sent it to someone at Warner Brothers, and here he was. Your part, General McAllister, is the great character of this piece, the young man confided, shaking with nerves. Mitch was sure that he had said the same to Mel and Danny about their roles. Let me get you a drink, young fella. Mitch offered to calm him down. <laughs> I've only been here four days. I'm from Illinois. Mr. Director is nice, but he keeps fixing things in the script, making it better, he says. Gosh, I guess it's better. Uh, which version did you get? <laughs> I don't know. At the bar, Mitch ordered uh, the kid a whiskey, fearing for the young man in this world of sharks where let me make it better means let me rewrite it. He suddenly felt old, this kid full of hope and wanting to be part of this world of film made no sense. But then, of course, it did. Mitch hated suffering these fits of cynicism. Why couldn't he just celebrate this good job and count his lucky stars? You wrote a nice script, young man. Mitch Hi, tried to... Hi, Marvin. Just hold, hold it just a moment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Donald. Was that Lee Marvin? I'll talk to him. <laughs> it's, it's the other Marvin. He's on his way to the post office to mail a letter. Okay. Da, 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 da. The boy smiled and they both relaxed a bit. He wandered from room to room, feeling very much on edge, of, uh, on the edge of the small group of beautiful people. So he walked out and waited in the garden for his car. The stunning view of the sparkling lights of Los Angeles and Hollywood 
was something straight out of F. Scott Fitzgerald. From this pinnacle, everything seemed possible. Suddenly he loved Fitzgerald and that boy who had written this film and all the yearnings of all the boys who had come west to make a mark. At that moment in the lavish night garden against the buzz of the party and the faint tinkle of crystal, Mitch understood the young writer. He recalled himself at that age and understood the wave of desire that had engulfed him all those years ago when he walked through the doors of the carriage house players theater in louisville kentucky on that day in 1953. terrific marcia thank you mitch that's 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 wonderful thanks well, marsh ladies and gentlemen as we say in class you know, Patty's got lunch, it's ready to go. <laughs> it, it's 12 noon, we'll be eating it virtually. If you've enjoyed today, just send me a little email and I'll send your notes on to Mitch. Uh, you all have my email address. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and post this on YouTube in the next couple of days. Uh, we have a, a Mitchell Ryan uh, YouTube site, as I mentioned. And Donald, I can't have the Whoa, final is word. me. Donald Freed, you must have the final word, please. Oh, well, there was a lot of love here today. Let that be the final word. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Gary. You're, uh, you're quite a good. I hate you forever for getting me a, a Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And, and there, there are a lot of you people that are, have learned technology because of me. And I don't do tech support anymore. You got to go find your own. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll see you soon. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm going to hang on. If anyone wants to talk, I, I'm certainly here to talk. So I'm going to certainly end the recording. Um, but it's nice to... Um, I'm going to cancel the recording.